Hey, it's Christine from Storyworthy. Do you ever wonder what to do with old cassette tapes and reel-to-reel tapes? And I'll find that people are selling old reel-to-reel tapes they find in attics and basements and garage sales. Did you know people are out there willing to buy them? And I would collect these tapes and I would digitize them once I got to the point where we were digitizing everything. And I'd get the reel-to-reel player out and I'd put these tapes on and I would capture these sounds. Some of the tapes were so old that they will actually literally crumple and kill themselves. They They will break apart as they're going through the heads and so I've got it plugged into my computer and I'm literally capturing the sounds as the tapes destroy themselves. Today we talk with six-time Emmy award-winning comedy writer Dan O'Shannon about collecting tapes and creating air checks. Stay close. Hey, it's Dan O'Shannon and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Beverly Hills, California. I am so glad you guys tuned in today. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. I hope you guys enjoyed the story last week, The Heckler, by comedian Rich Scheidner. Now, I have to say, I could have talked to Rich all day, honestly. He is uh, such an interesting person, and he's so truthful and so open about what went on in the 80s in terms of the comedy boom and what was going on in comedy. So if you're a fan of stand-up comedy in any way, you have to get Rich's book. It's called Kicking Through the Ashes. And I'm telling you, it's, it's a thick book. I'll say that. It's actually 82 chapters. I kid you not. Now, they're short chapters. But nonetheless, uh, Rich is just, he's a pro. And so I want you guys first to go get the book, buy the book. Then I want you to listen to Rich's show on Storyworthy and then read the book. See what I'm saying? Like in that order. But this week, you guys, I'm so excited to have the extremely talented television writer and author Dan O'Shannon with me. And Dan brings forth the topic, unusual hobbies. And that's, that's a new topic for Storyworthy. We haven't heard that before. And it's, um, it's, it's like at first, I thought like, oh, well, that's easy because, you know, I played tennis and I play guitar. But those aren't unusual, right? I'm anxious to hear what Dan has to say because, you know, he works all the time. So, like, when does he have any time for any of his hobbies. So like if his hobby is like, somehow he does it in his car in traffic, maybe that. Or maybe he has a hobby in the shower, I don't know. But it did get me to thinking about my own. And I would say the only unusual one I have is, I don't even know if it's a hobby, it's just something I do. I stand on my head. I stand on my head every day for like half hour. And sometimes I do it like 15 minutes at a time. And sometimes I do it for a whole half hour, like I'll just watch TV on my head. And sometimes at the gym, I stand on my head and I tweet. People (laughs) look at me and, but, but I don't know. I just have this, I guess I have a really good sense of balance. It's not so much a yoga move as it's just something about getting blood into my head and it just feels good, right? So it's sort of a meditation thing and I can do it without arms as it were. Uh, I actually can stand on my head on a paddleboard in the ocean. I don't mean to brag. You know, look, I don't mean to like tout my, this is one of my special skills, Dan O'Shannon. You don't even I, know. I want to see you stand on your head now. But it is, well, while you're doing your story, I'm going to stand no, on your head No, don't, 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 because that's all, I can't focus. <laughs> I'll tell you, after this, after this, stand on your head. I will. One time I did an entire story at IO West on my head. And then I started laughing so hard because the audience was, you know, they were so funny and I was laughing and. So I fell over at one point, but I almost I almost got through it. But yeah, I can uh, go out on a paddleboard in the ocean. People on the pier applaud. And, you know, I'll take it because it's Hollywood. What can I tell you? Do you ever post pictures of that? I've never, you know, look, I don't post the personal stuff, Dan. I post, <laughs> sure, I post a nude shot now and then. Yeah, no, I've seen that. <laughs> but nothing personal. No, I have to turn them upside down myself. If you stand on your head, it'll save me so much time. Listen, here's the thing with hobbies, okay? Mm-hmm. I was kind of looking into it. There's four different things. You can do things, you can make things, you can collect things, and you can learn things. Like Those are all hobbies. I guess that means like extracurricular of work, I guess. Anyway, we're going to talk about unusual hobbies today. But before we get to Dan's story, I did want to remind you guys to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Storyworthy. And why not head over to StoryworthyPodcast.com and join my mailing list. 
Now you knew that I was going to say this and I'm going to stop saying it whenever you join my mailing list. So that's, that's what it is. It's push comes to shove. Okay. I keep repeating it until you do. Okay. Storyworthypodcast.com. I got one more thing. Let me ask you guys something. Have you ever been to like, like a party or a dinner and you've talked about a podcast and then you got like that question, you know, what's a podcast? How do you listen to them? All this month, we're asking listeners to show other people how to listen to a podcast on their phone. Now, if they don't have a podcasting app, which they probably do, but if they don't, you can show them how to download one, like maybe Stitcher, that's what I use, or maybe the Wondery app on an Android. And then you can show them how to find new shows like Storyworthy. And you can give them examples of when to listen, like while they're driving or cooking, walking the dog, standing on their head. That's just me. <laughs> and remind them, you guys, remind them that podcasts are free. And then you can tell me what you recommended by using the hashtag tripod, T-R-Y pod for try a podcast. And thanks you guys so much for spreading the word. Okay, here we go, guys. Let's talk to Dan O'Shannon. All right, now Dan O'Shannon is a television writer and producer, like I mentioned, and he has worked on shows like New Heart, Cheers, Frasier, as well as many, many other shows like Better Off Ted, Jericho, Suddenly Susan, Threshold. He was also an executive producer on Modern Family for several seasons and also on The Odd Couple, the most recent one with Matthew Perry and Thomas Lennon. Now, aside from television writing, Dan is also the author of two books, The Adventures of Mrs. Jesus, which is where I met you. That's right. Because we were at your book. I was hosting your book launch party at Skylight Books. Right. And also the book, What Are You Laughing At? A Comprehensive Guide to the Comedic Event, which I got to tell you guys, it's a big, thick book <laughs> that completely breaks down and dissects comedy and laughter and how the two intersect. And it's actually a very technical book, which I I don't own it, but I work in a bookstore, so I, I, <laughs> I can, look I, at it. I can just give you one. You should. Yeah. And it's really interesting. I mean, it's it breaks it down, and I'm such a fan of comedy, so I love it. Anyway, you guys, you can follow Dan ranting about Trump on Facebook. That's, that, that's where you can find him. Anyway, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the one and only Dan O'Shannon. Thank you. So uh, my unusual hobby, I guess, is that I, I collect air checks. And uh, air checks are recordings from radio, television, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, generally speaking, they come from when disc jockeys would create tapes of themselves uh, as sales tools or just examples of how they work and they're called air checks and they're on tapes and they fly around the country and that sort of thing. Uh, but to give a little background to that, I grew up in the Cleveland area uh, back in the 70s and I was kind of a lonely kid uh, and we lived out on a farm away from everything and I used to listen a lot to the radio and I'd watch TV and I would hear the sounds of stations coming in at night from Cleveland, the big city that was near us, and uh, and at night, as far away as St. Louis, we'd get uh, uh, radio stations in. I'd listen to the disc jockeys and the music and the commercials, and it sort of kept me company in a way, and it told me that there was life out there beyond the farm. And then one day I grew up, and I came out to Los Angeles and started writing TV. Well, in 1999, on the internet, I saw that somebody from the Ohio area was selling for five bucks a cassette tape that somebody had basically taped an hour's worth of the radio from 1977, and it was a radio station called WGAR, 1220 WGAR, Cleveland, which I used to listen to quite a lot. It was my favorite station back then. I used to listen to it to, on, on my mom's clock radio, which was on the counter next to the uh, sink when I would wash dishes at night, you know. Um, and, um, and I bought it, five bucks, and I popped it into my player in my car, and it was like time travel. Now, you can listen to old songs. They're, they're always around. Songs don't ever go away, so you can listen to oldies all you want. But what's different is you'd hear the voices of these disc jockeys from that time, and they're doing their own style of humor, and they're referencing things that were current then. And you'd hear the news reports and the sports reports, and you know, I remember that sportscaster. And then the, one of the cool things about it I found were the jingles for the, uh, not only the radio station itself, but for, for commercials, for commercials, that, for businesses that were long gone, the Cleveland Press and, and Uncle Bill's, which is a store that was big then, uh, Higby's, Halley's, you know, whatever. And I, they would go into a commercial and you would hear the singers singing and it was like this explosion in my head of, I remember that. And as I'm remembering it, I'm singing along with the commercial. The words are coming back to me one by one, reconstructing themselves in my head. I couldn't get enough of this tape. So I contacted the guy, he had a couple more tapes, and then I started doing some work into the collection of air checks. And it turns out that people collect these from all over the world, from any time period, and they just amass huge collections. I tend to collect them from the Cleveland area, Northeastern Ohio, 
Uh, and I focus on from about, you know, the late 50s into about 1990. And you'd be surprised how much stuff I end up getting. And I found other collectors and I started getting, you know, cassette tapes is what it was at first. And then I, I started to contact old disc jockeys that were on the radio when I was growing up. And what was really nice is a lot of them had some of their stuff on reel to reel tapes that they were nice enough to send me. And they were all very flattered to hear that they were people who grew up and fondly remembered them. Now, these, these disc jockeys back then, they were on the radio. They were just sort of in the background of everybody's life. You know, they were on the, the car radio when your girlfriend broke up with you. Or they were, like I say, you're doing dishes and they're on or, or whatever. They're just there for all the big parts of our lives. And they're making jokes and they're telling the news and they're telling stories and they're introducing songs. And, and in their minds, they just said this stuff into the ether and it disappeared. And then they were forgotten as soon as they were uttered. And to have like me call them up and say, you know, I work on Cheers and I really am a big fan of your stuff. It, it you know, they all really appreciate it. And, and I had to tell them, look, I'm speaking for all the people who won't bother to pick up the phone or look you up on the internet. We all listened. You were just there for us all. So it was nice to do that. And I would collect these tapes and I would digitize them once I got to the point where we were digitizing everything. And I'd get the reel-to-reel -reel player out and I'd put these tapes on and I would capture these sounds. Some of the tapes were so old that they will actually literally crumple and kill themselves. They, they will dis break apart uh, as they're going through the heads. And so I've got it plugged into my computer and I'm literally capturing the sounds as the tapes destroy themselves. And what happens is over the years, I, I, you know, as I say, I contacted disc jockeys. I, every time I'm in Cleveland, I just sort of get the word out that I'm looking for old tapes. Some people, they'll, they'll find old cassette tapes or, or whatever. Or I go to eBay and I look around, you know, sort of the Cleveland area and I'll find that people are selling old reel-to-reel -reel tapes. They find in attics and basements and garage sales. And um, they don't know what's on them because they have nothing to play them on. So they put them on eBay. I spend a few bucks thinking maybe there's radio on them. Um, and so this has become uh, not an obsession, but something that, that takes up an awful lot of my time as I archive everything. Now, this has led to sort of three, three sort of side hobbies. This branches into three parts now. And one is just the archiving of this stuff, because I tend to be very specific. I want the dates of these recordings. But disc jockeys do not customarily say the date every few minutes. So I will listen to recording, and there's no way on the surface to tell when it's from. And this is where you become a detective and you become very, very good at listening. And you listen for clues, and sometimes they're very easy. Sometimes it's a sports score, and then you go on the internet and you look it up. Or there's something in the news, and you can find, you can go through archives of old newspapers. Uh, I'm very happy to say that someone archived the entire collection of the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which was the big newspaper in Cleveland, so that you could look up any keyword and find everything there is on it. So if a disc jockey or a caller to his disc jockey mentions one little tiny thing in the news, if you look hard enough, you might be able to find it. Now, often these clues, you have to find clues in pieces. They give you pieces. It's like blues clues. And so you'll hear a jewelry store commercial saying, well, this Sunday is Mother's Day. Okay, now I know it's a month in May right before Mother's Day. Don't know the year, don't know the day. And then somebody says, well, tonight's weather is this, tomorrow is going to be that, and Thursday is going to be this. So if you got tonight, tomorrow, and Thursday, that means tonight is a Tuesday. Now we know it's a Tuesday before Mother's Day. Then somebody says, well, we lost to the Orioles last night. So you need... A Cleveland Indians game where we lost to the Orioles on a Monday before Mother's Day. Now I have the date of the recording, and it gets filed. You see, uh, there was one where uh, someone sent me a tape from a station called Wixie, Wixie 1260, and said, I can't find the date on this thing. Can you take a listen? And, and there's this disc jockey, and he does mention at one point, he mentions a couple times that it's date night, which on Wixie always meant, you know, Saturday night. So I know it's a Saturday night. But I can't even narrow the year down because it's an oldies weekend. So they're playing oldies. So it doesn't tell me from that. So I can't even like narrow it down. So then at one point, the disc jockey says that he's substituting for a second disc jockey, which is doing a public appearance, a personal appearance, because the third disc jockey broke his leg. So I look <laughs> online to see if there's any notice of any local disc jockey breaking their leg in an accident or anything like that. Don't find it. But I look through all this other archive stuff that I've got about this particular station, and I find that there's only a six-month period when these three disc jockeys worked at the station at the same time. And then at another point in the, in the recording, someone mentions that the weather is 20 degrees. So now I can eliminate the summer. Okay, I'm getting closer and closer. And then I start going week by week in the Cleveland Plain Dealer where they're mentioning radio weekend contests, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing, and um, promotions. And somebody said that Wixie is having a that old thing weekend. I don't know, know what this even means, but that's all it says. But then as I'm listening to the recording for the millionth time, after Gary Lewis and the Playboys song, 
the disc jockey says, well, there's that old thing again, and we're going to listen to another one, and, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's, that's such an odd turn of phrase. That's the weekend. It's the Saturday night of that weekend. So, so it's, it's, like, it's like these recordings want you to know when they're from. They're trying to tell you. And you become, like I say, this, this detective, this expert at kind of like piecing it out one bit by one bit until you have it. And it becomes sort of obsessive. And then you look up and five hours has passed as you've nailed down the date of recording. So that's, that's one thing that is sort of the, the hobby. It's just the archiving itself. The other is, you might remember I was talking about how you would listen to these old commercials and it would explode in your head as you'd remember it. Well, I started to collect those on the side and make collections of just commercials from the Cleveland area from back in the you know, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, I called this the collection the Cleveland Memory Grenade because of the explosion that would go off in your head. And I started sending them to baby boomers I knew in Ohio who grew up with this stuff, and they all had the same reaction. They would call me up and say, this is amazing. I played at a party. We all just gathered around, started singing along, and where'd you get these things? Uh, and now I actually sell them. Out. They're actually sold out of a couple stores in Cleveland. The money goes to charity, and every year I update the collection with either better quality recordings of some of these old, old things or, or new jingles, new old jingles that I find. Um, so that, that's sort of the secondary hobby. And the third is the most personal. Uh, as you'll recall, I said that I get a lot of these tapes from eBay. And I take a chance and I listen. No one knows what's on these tapes, generally speaking, when they sell them to me. And it's usually one of three things. One, somebody has recorded the radio or TV. Sometimes they just record the songs and then they click off when the DJ s starts talking, which I used to do when I was a kid. And now it's like, oh, I, I lost the best stuff. Um, but sometimes you get a little bit of TV or radio and that goes in the collection. Other times people just record albums or church services or something like that and those get thrown away. But the third is that there are recordings of lives that I hear, people's lives. I, I listened to a 1961 New Year's Eve party once through my headphones. I could hear ice clinking in the glasses. I could hear people getting drunk and laughing. And somebody did a Kennedy impression. And it was like this, this, this night had happened in 1961 and someone froze it. And it all came to life in my head in this, this little room in Los Angeles where I was listening. Uh, it just stayed alive long enough for one more person to experience that evening. Um, now, if I hear people's lives on the radio, I've heard audio letters from Vietnam, uh, tapes that people in Vietnam made for their families asking about this person, and they went to school with that person, they can't wait to come home, and this and that. Uh, if these people from the past say their names, particularly if they're guys, because women, girls tend to grow up and get married and change their names, certainly back then, if they say their names, their first and last name, I will search for them now and find them and try to return their sounds to them. There was a, uh, a young fellow, about 11 years old, uh, playing with his dad's recorder, tape recorder in 1957 with his little brother. And the two of them are horsing around for about half an hour. I'm listening to these two kids playing with their dad's tape recorder, which must have been a giant machine in 1957. And at one point, the kid finally says his first and last name. So I do a little looking around and I find him in Cleveland and I call him. And now... I'm talking to a guy in his 70s. Now, I'm, I had just spent a half hour with him as an 11-year-old. So I time travel to the present, and now a 70-year-old man is talking to me, and I say, you don't know me, but I live in Los Angeles, and, and you know, uh, I, I, I have this recording of you and your brother. And he didn't know what I was talking about at first, and then he remembered that his dad did indeed have a tape recorder, and then I got his brother's name right. So I digitized the recording and sent it to him, and he called me back, or actually he emailed me the nicest letter about how he and his brother listened to this thing, and, and it was just this great memory for them. Because back then, the time that all these tapes would have come from, you know, we record everything now without thinking of it. Everything is recorded. The, the people growing up today, there's going to be no undocumented moment of their lives. But back then, it was kind of a rare thing. So there was one... It was a little poignant. Uh, there was this uh, recording from a, uh, a remote radio broadcast, and a girl goes to the microphone, and she dedicates a song to her sister, Valerie Pettit, and wishes her good luck being homecoming queen uh, at Euclid High School. So, of course, I run to the Internet, and I look up and find out that Valerie Pettit was on the homecoming court. There's a picture of her right there on the homecoming court of Euclid High School, 1968. I also do a little bit of looking and find out she did not win, which I know, but the girl in the recording does not yet know. And I look up Valerie Pettit through the Alumni Association at uh, Euclid, and I say, you don't know me. I live in Los Angeles. I have a recording of your sister uh, wishing you good luck, and would you like this? And she gets a bit emotional about it, and she says yes, because her younger sister died a couple years after graduating from high school. So there wasn't a lot of recording of this person. So I digitize, and there they are now decades later listening to the voice of this girl, the daughter, sibling, saying that she loves her sister, and good luck. So... Um, 
you know, it's the weirdest thing. Uh, there was one that was very sad. It was a cassette tape. It was unlabeled. I got from a flea market in Ohio. I took a chance. And it's a guy talking to his three-year-old son and grilling him on what happens at his mother's house when he's not there. And obviously trying to get some sort of evidence that he could then use in court against her. Apparently they'd been divorced or something like that. And this poor kid is just answering these questions over and over while really not paying attention. And the dad is, come on, answer. What, what, do you know what they were drinking? Do you know what? Was it was it pop? Was it this? Was it that? I, I didn't even listen to the whole tape. I tossed it because I don't think some things should survive time travel, you know. But the hobby, it, it, it becomes when it's people's lives. It feels like what I do is I throw this fishing line into the past and I don't know what I'm going to pull up. And that is my unusual hobby. Wow, that's really, really interesting. Oh, thanks. Now, those two brothers, the older gentlemen, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That, that must have been astounding for them. Yeah, they're, they're them. Not, yeah, they've long forgotten about it. And then not only does someone say, oh, here's this recording, it's some stranger who listened to it by chance. And, and where did you, know? you find that one? That was from an eBay collection. Somebody found a big box of old tapes in a garage, and I took a few. I took a chance, spent a few bucks. They send, you know, there are. I, I, we're actually recording this from my home. I should explain to the listeners. And if you turn around, there's a couple of boxes on my counter that were wow. from the mail. They're new. Those, those, I just got those, and those are from eBay, and they are unlabeled uh real to real tapes i have no idea what's on them now, after this that, we can open up and listen to a couple and see that is unbelievable <laughs> now that's not what you mean though by taking a chance in other words oh, wait well i'm taking a chance that they might be for my collection they might be usable for my collection right so i spend a few bucks and i listen be- to but them but it's not that's no there's no money involved because they can't cost much right i mean how much is oh, an old cassette? no 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 well well or old real to reels but uh you know sometimes it, sometimes people will sell them in a collection they'll find 70 of these things like, I, I bought like those things probably about uh 30 bucks for that bigger box and maybe like and that's you know, a huge box yeah, that's probably got about 14 tapes and 15 maybe so the so the taking a chance isn't in money really it's not the 30 bucks it's the time that you have to go through to yeah, listen exactly and so and so when people sell these things do they give you like a pitch like you know on this reel to reel you might hear my cousin's no. vacation no they often say that we don't know what's on these things and we have nothing to play them on so the I people see. selling them have no idea what's on them, so, for the most part. So right here in your home, just tell me, you have a cassette player. Well, I have a cassette player, but I also have, the, behind me, there's a reel-to-reel Reel-to-reel. player. And I pop. I have wires that go into my laptop that right. catches all the sounds and digitizes it. And I just listen through headphones. Do you have a VCR? Uh, yeah, I have a VCR. I have a, beta, <laughs> I have a VCR for, for old TV. T- I have a right. beta, Betamax. Do you have vinyl? Uh, yeah, I have vinyl. I have a you know, cart some... machine from an old radio station, too. I see you have all these different ways to listen mm-hmm. uh, to things. Yeah. So there's really two things going on. I mean, I hear your love of old of old DJs sure. and people doing jingles. Mm-hmm. So that's one side of things. And then the personal thing, that's kind of like more of like you're discovering America's funniest home videos or something. like. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm discovering random acts of life that were caught and captured and I, it's, it's almost like people's lives are, are frozen in amber and I get to thaw them out and listen to them come to life again yeah I think it's fantastic but I'm, I'm, it's, I'm just curious how you are you break your time into both so when you listen to these some of them might go into the archives under jingles and others might go into oh well it's all it tends to uh, all go in the archive for example it's, if, let's say it's an hour's worth of radio okay. and in that hour's are two or three different commercials that might go in my collection well I, I archive the entire hour and that goes into my, my radio collection and then from that, I'll make copies of the commercials that I'll, I'll keep in this other file where I keep radio commercials. So, you know. So then do you throw away the source material because you can't keep all that stuff around, right? Oh, well, I did. Well, it's the source material. Yeah, the physical stuff because it's all digitized. So it all fits on a hard drive. I've got thousands of hours now, but they all fit on a hard drive. Right, but it's the reel to reels. The reel to reel. Unless it's a real special reel to reel. Like, I think I have the actual reel to reel that has those two kids from 1957 because it's got some really interesting That's stuff amazing. from a, a radio station. It's, it's actually recorded a lot of a station called Channel 8 in Cleveland, Ohio in 1957. And you listen to it, and there's this one part of the afternoon. Now, this is such early TV that for one part of the afternoon, they just play songs. And I don't know what was on the screen at this. And it's like Muzak. You know, right. There's just cuts of Muzak. And I don't know what was on the screen at that time that would have been the 1957 screensaver. Was it a shot of downtown Cleveland? Was sure. it pastoral images? Or a flag. Right, right. But at one point, the record skips. And it goes on for a full three or four minutes before some, you hear this. Somebody <laughs> and then it, it up. goes back. That's so, classic. Uh, and you hear these, like there's the, some uh, PSAs. There's one urging kids to keep looking at the skies and reporting any unusual aircraft they see. Wow. That's fantastic. Yeah, and you would never think that people did that until you hear it and go, wow, that was part of the tapestry of that time. Sure. Now, did you listen to KDKA? No, I wasn't. I lived in Ohio. 
But I thought KDKA was like oh, that was like it was not a, Pittsburgh, where I'm from. Yeah, but, but, but I thought that was Pittsburgh, Cleveland is kind of all the same thing. No, no, it's, we had our own Cleveland. I mean, you couldn't really pick up uh, Pennsylvania Station. Maybe at nighttime, sometimes I on KDKA on... was like the strongest signal east of the Rockies or east yeah. of the Mississippi or something. No, yeah, no. I'm gonna tell my mom. You she, tell her. Oh, well, she I'll just loves KDKA. Right um, wait. So listen, when you listen to the cassettes here at the house, the mm-hmm. ones that literally are crumbling. Oh yeah, yeah. They crumble. Yeah, it doesn't happen. That that doesn't happen often, but it has happened. I'll actually position it's that player. I actually position it over a wastebasket so that the pieces of tape can drop in the wastebasket as I'm capturing the sounds digitally. And so, do you have to then clean the machine? I mean, yeah, yeah. Which I'm not very good at really doing that, but there is a guy in the valley who services and repairs these things. And like once or once every year or two, I'll, I'll haul. Uh, I've got actually two of those tape decks. I'll haul them over there and he'll. Two of those reel to reel decks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They play different speeds, and you know. And what does his place look? like? Like, I bet that's a... It's full of all this old stuff. It's really cool to go in there. I bet. Yeah. I bet that's as authentic as you get. Yeah. Have you met anybody else that is doing this in in terms of even the archiving or the personal stuff or the jingle stuff? I meet people who collect the air checks, the the, the recordings. Can you spell that for me, by the way? It's all one word. A-I-R-C-H-E-C-K, air check. Air check. Yeah. I've never heard that word. Oh, you know, uh, Google it when we're all off here. In fact, I, se- I suspect everybody should, at the end of this, have a little homework and just take a look because it's kind of fun. You know, and also, people, look, uh, Google air checks and then your hometown because oh, wow. you might find that stations you used to listen to. If you grew up in Detroit, you might have listened to CKLW, the Motor City, and because uh, I could get that one in on my radio, so I have a bunch of stuff from there. Yeah. You know, but uh, you might find that, that the stations from where you grew up, you might be able to pop in a tape and time travel a little bit yourself. I can still totally hear two specific things. My mother was a huge talk radio fan, which so I grew up listening to talk radio, which kind of translates into my love of podcasting. But I always remember... Two things specifically. One was like the Children's Hospital Christmas Drive. Mm. And the children would come on the radio, Kitty K, and, you know, say hi to their families. And, you know, hi to my mom and dad in South Hills and whatever. Yeah. The other one would be the school closings on on. Oh, snow my days. God. I used to love doing that. Yeah, I'd wake up. You'd wake up, and it would be freezing cold. You'd have to get under the cover, out from under the covers right. where it was warm. And it was freezing cold. You'd turn on the radio, and they would announce the school closings. And you would just hold your breath waiting for your school to right. close. And it depends on, because it goes alphabetical. alphabetical. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was the Babcock School District. Oh, you were. So I yeah. was at the top of the list. But if you didn't tune in or you woke up and they were in the case, then oh, you would yeah. wait. Yeah. And then they would go through the school closures. Then the one-hour delay, and then the two-hour delay. We had, you know what? The two-hour delay, for people who don't remember that, is that you would, like, listen for your school to be closed. You'd look outside. It would still be dark because you had to get up for school. It would still be dark, but snow would be flying all over the place. And you're freezing in your pajamas, and it's kind of like, oh, do I have to get up? And you do the school closing, and then they would do all the school closing, and your school wouldn't be there. And then it would say, Painesville Township Schools are on a two-hour delay basis. And you'd be, nah, because it meant that you you could get a little more sleep, but you had to get up, and the school opened two hours later. Right. But very, very often, the snow would keep coming down for those two hours, and they would eventually cancel. Anyway. So you'd be ready for school, right. and you're for but no reason. we had a one-hour delay as well. So yeah. we had the one-hour delay, the two-hour delay, or the straight-out close. Yeah, but those are memories. Like I can picture it was so quiet outside, and I can picture all the sounds in my house. And you know, I had I have four sisters and one brother, so there's a lot of people in a very small space. Right. But I could just those uh, sounds from the radio are so comforting. Yeah. It's almost like some people like to listen to a baseball game on in the background. Right. It's sort of like that. Yeah, it is. It's like there's there's life out there, but it's life that doesn't force you to engage with it. <laughs> exactly. Now here's um here's something I wrote down. Are you a fan of Stephen King? Yeah. So he loves radio a lot, and mm-hmm. he's done a lot of different interesting radio programs. Uh, one thing he did was with Shooter Jennings. Shooter Jennings did an album. It was kind of a conceptual album, only two or three years old, really, maybe four years old. And Stephen King acts as the radio announcer between every song. So oh, you'll fun. have to listen to it. It's oh, really yeah, yeah. interesting. So it's like a live broadcast, yeah. and it's it's fabulous. So I want you to hear that. I'm just, I just took some notes here while we were talking. Um, by the way, listening to that New Year's Eve party in 1961, mm-hmm. that to me sounds almost too creepy. Like It was very strange. It was like being in that room, just they couldn't see me because I was from years later. But uh, that's one of the, I regret that I didn't keep that tape. That was early when I was collecting this, and I didn't, I didn't did you, have did that. Did you digitize it, though? No, I didn't, because uh, back then I was, it was all about the collection. I and see. I didn't really get into getting into these people's lives or, or sort of keeping these as a record of how we lived. 
until until like a couple years later. Okay, so have you met other people that do this? We, I asked you oh, that yeah. before. What yeah, there are many people who collect air checks. Oh, they don't okay. go into the necessarily you know, doing a side collection of jingles or doing the kind of getting involved in people's lives. It really is about collecting the radio stuff. Uh, but I haven't met anyone who's quite as fanatical as me about getting the dates right. Um, um, so I, have a, I know a lot of people who have hundreds of hours of stuff, but it's either mislabeled or the wrong dates or it's even the wrong stations, wrong years, you know. And, and so you want to collect it, and it's like, I think I have that. Maybe I don't have it, but then you get it, and you find that you do have it, just the date's wrong. Uh, so people are collecting it. And like I said, go online. You'll find that, that people collect it all the time. It sounds like a podcast by itself, this whole, you know, the air check podcast. I, I, believe, it, I believe it is. But you and yeah. yeah. Oh, really? You think yeah. there is one now? I, I, I'll bet you anything. Because there's something about I'm not kidding. Podcasting. I'm not saying you have to do it on a broad level, but even just to to share the knowledge that you already have. It's almost like doing a TED Talk or um, even a Facebook Live just to talk about it because it's pretty fascinating. And I don't think a lot of people know about this. And I don't think a lot of people have clock radios either anymore. You. <laughs> Dan O'Shannon, that's fantastic. Dan O'Shannon has a clock radio <laughs> here in his house right below an Emmy Award. So there's that. <laughs> that's perfect. Okay, here's what, one more thing I want to ask you, and we're going to wrap this up. Um, here's what I want to ask you. In Hollywood, do you think, and I've asked a couple other guests this, that if you try, 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 and you do have stick to that you'll succeed? Oh, well, you know, I, I, think, that, uh, I think there's no guarantee ever. You know, uh, um, I, I always say when I talk to classes about this, you know, people would show me scripts and say, do you think I could be a writer based on this script that I wrote? And I would say, uh, no, I, I, I can only tell you if I think this is a good script. I don't know if you wrote it by yourself or you had a lot of input. It took you a day to write, a year to write, whatever. And you tell me all that, but I can still only tell you if this is a good script. Because being able to write, and I'm using writing as an example, but I think this is true of every sort of creative career. Um, being able to write is only one-fourth of what you need to have and maintain a career. Okay, the ability that, that you know that talent and that ability to craft a script and that ability to uh, evolve and grow and and become that artist is one fourth. You also need in your own personality a certain amount of ambition. You need to be the one that says yes to yourself when a thousand people say no. The one who keeps getting up and doing it over and over. Who takes three jobs and still writes on the weekends. Uh, the third element is political savvy. It is a collaborative medium. Everything in Hollywood is collaborative. We'd like to think that the artist is a sort of a solo creative force, but you have to take notes from people you don't agree with. You have to go into meetings. You have to work with other writers. You have to know when to fight for something, when to let something go. You have to know if you're going into a meeting, you have to do your research so you know who you're talking to and, and what this is all about. It's political savvy. You have to play well with others. And fourth is luck, and that's the wild card in the whole bit. Now, you need some, some version of these four, or if you have nothing but luck, then maybe you don't even need the other three. But... With all of that, because luck being that wild card, there are no guarantees. But here's the thing. If you don't push and you don't keep trying, we know you won't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. It's just such an elusive thing sometimes because in other career choices, even if you want to be a doctor, you go to a certain amount of school and you learn a certain amount of things mm -hmm. and you will be a doctor right. unless you don't pass the test. But right. it, let's say you can pass the test. Mm -hmm. But working in the entertainment industry specifically whether you're a dancer or a writer or a producer or a set designer it, it none of it adds up to that there's no staircase to that as it were there's no way to just go step one step two step three i'm a producer it doesn't right. work like that right no you're absolutely right and it, there is so much politic happening everywhere and, and also uh, you know part of it is that the, much of this requires a certain amount of creativity now there, i'm sure they're very creative doctors but uh, creativity is not a requirement <laughs> um you know you have to be insightful you have to think you have to you know uh, learn your stuff and do it but when creativity is this thing where you're getting paid to think of something you haven't thought of yet and they're going to pay you knowing that tomorrow your job is to think of something tomorrow and then think of something new the next day and something new the day after that and you're competing with other people who come up with something new and and, and not everyone can agree on what's good you can right. agree if, if there's an operation that's successful everyone can agree it worked but if, like, we're in a writer's room and someone comes up with a funny story, not everyone's going to agree that's a funny story. Well, and really the only person's opinion that matters is the showrunner in that respect, right? Because well, the showrunner the, knows what the executives want, and the showrunner says, I need something, you know, more romance-based, or mm -hmm. they give you a direction. That's the direction you have to take whether you don't want to or not. Well, but even then, the, the, the showrunner might do everything that he or she is supposed to do, and the network still might say, mm, no thanks. 
or they might, you know, sabotage it by putting in a show they like better because they have a deal with this particular actor or actress, and we're going to put that in and put all the promotion behind that because we think people are going to want to see this guy in his fifth sitcom as opposed to your original idea who has people we don't recognize. There are so many factors that will determine whether a show is going to work. Uh, the planets have to align almost impossibly. Yeah. And I think that what I take from all this and what I've learned, I've, I've been out in L.A. for 20 years, is that you can't take any of it personally. No. Because if you think for a second it's about you, you're just going to get railroaded over. I mean, people yeah. are just going to plow right over you because it has nothing to do really with you. Right. If you're in the right place in the right time and you have all those skills that you've acquired and right. so you've got the the – you can back it up with your experience. Yeah. But yeah, to actually make uh, something go is, you know, it's interesting though. And then we're going to wrap it up. But even if things don't go, like I still really appreciate living here in Los Angeles yeah. because I love the weather. I love playing tennis. I like my cat, my child, you know, like I still, even if things aren't perfect, it's still, you know, if you're comfortable living here, then it's a good life to yeah. me. I agree. I think you need a certain amount of cynicism in order to optimize your optimism. You can't be unrealistically optimistic mm -hmm. because you will just keep getting crushed. You have to be realistically optimistic, and that requires some pessimism. And to bring it back around to air checks uh, to wrap it up, I think that might be part of what appeals to me is that I listen to the old radio, and it takes me to a time when if there, I'm sure there was pol politics and cynicism, cynicism in, in 1960s and 70s radio, but to me, listening to it as a kid, it was all very innocent, and it was all very fun and exciting, and I didn't know about the politics and the backstabbing and, and the things that have to happen. When I listen to people's lives, it's people who aren't in show business. You know, it's people whose lives haven't been written and rewritten and cast with beautiful actors and then directed by award-winning directors and edited and put out there for you. So it's real life. And I think there's a part of me learns to yearns to connect with that because so much of my life is creating fake, synthesized life and putting it in front of viewers I think that makes a lot of sense you know that makes it for you personally that makes so much sense because 12 hours of the day is in a, a fairy tale as it mm -hmm. were yeah and that so why don't you do reality TV because <laughs> <laughs> it's still TV and it's still a messed up business and I, I think part of me just goes back to uh, a time when uh Certainly my view of the world was a little more innocent. I have to dip back into that. Ah, man, I'll tell you what. It's hard to do these days. Yeah. It really is. Hey, listen, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I'm just really, I'm thrilled to sit down with you finally. It's, we've been, talked about this for a couple of years now. I know, and I'm really excited to hear about air checks, learn about air checks. Yeah, look and them up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into it. I think there might be a show out there, a podcast out there for that. You know, I'm, I bet you uh, there are a million old Pittsburgh uh, air checks you can look up. Oh, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Exactly. And I have a couple of good DJ friends back there still, like Jimmy Crenn, and I bet you he knows about that as well. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to look into that. All right, you guys, i got to wrap it up right about now. One more time for Dan O'Shannon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And let me know what you thought about the story and head over to Twitter and find me there at StoryWorthy. And I loved it. And if you're really feeling kind, go over to iTunes and give StoryWorthy a good review. I always need this. Five stars and a good review. Next time on StoryWorthy, we have an incredible story by comedy writer Lauren Reeves. One of my favorite things to do is just find shit. In the woods. It doesn't matter what it is. I just, I'm like a Christopher Columbus type. I love exploring. I love discovering things. And we find some cool stuff. You know, we do find woolly mammoth bones and Pleistocene era uh, bones. And it's really fun. You're like, oh, cool. I just found a mastodon or a dire wolf skull. Don't miss Lauren Reeves talking about that time she found a foot in the woods next time on Storyworthy. All right, you guys, I want to thank everybody over at Wondery Media, including Arnon Lopez and Jeffrey Glazer. And again, one more time, on behalf of my guest today, Dan O'Shannon, my name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a Storyworthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Storyworthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Storyworthy on iTunes and visit the Storyworthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Storyworthy.